I remember standing out here and looking at the hills, and when you look at these Coburg Hills, you know, I can barely hear the freeway traffic. To stand out in the middle of this and envision what, what this will mean to our patients when they get here. Just wondering sort of uh, what it would be like to have a quiet, serene environment where patients can meander around the property and talk to the counselors or talk to family members and just take a look at the Coburg Hills. It's that this has just turned into more than I could ever have hoped for. On this edition of Rick Dancer TV, we're on the campus in Coburg of Serenity Lane's brand new facility. Tonight, we're gonna show you around, introduce you to the people here, and you are gonna love this place and what they do. I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. <laughs> We're here with Larry Bradley from right. Serenity Lane. I love this place. I mean, 15 acres from that little squatty place you had down on campus. Yeah, it's hard to describe the change. How many people can you treat out here versus what you were able to before? We can double our capacity. Okay, so our old treatment center, we had a capacity of about 65 patients. This campus is designed to double to about 130 initially, 122, I think, because of some you know, some changes we made, but it'll roughly double initially and it's designed long term to double again. So initially we'll have 122 beds out here. It's quite a significant increase. And this is from people from all over the state will come here. That's right. You know, we used to get all our patients from right here in Lane County. Today we get about 20, 25 percent of our patients from Lane County. We get about 30, 35 percent from Portland, Vancouver, and the rest from throughout the state of Oregon. We get about 10 percent actually from out of state right now. Why does, why does treatment at Serenity Lane work so well? You know, for a lot of reasons. Okay, it doesn't always work, I should tell you that. Okay, we'd love to say it always works. As a matter of fact, there isn't an employee at Serenity Lane that wouldn't like this place to go out of business tomorrow for lack of demand. Okay, I should say that. Um, it doesn't always work, but many times it does. And there are many reasons why it does. Um, you know, we facilitate recovery here. We don't, we don't create it, we don't cause it. Okay, we facilitate a journey, hopefully, if, uh, for somebody who has no hope, they come to us financially, morally, spiritually bankrupt, and they have no hope, and we facilitate a process, an abstinence-based program, 12-step program, uh, where we give them a combination of individual counseling, group counseling, uh, just a variety of different treatment modes, and help them find a new journey. So it's, it's loving, it's caring, it's compassion, it's based upon abstinence, it's based upon helping them find a higher power. I mean, there are a lot of components that go into it. So how much did this new facility cost and donors obviously made this happen? You know, this is about a $28 million campus. Uh, donors were a big part of it. We borrowed a lot of money to make it happen. Uh, when we started raising money, I think there was a lot we didn't know that we didn't know. And so it's been a learning process all along the way. Uh, we've had a lot of financial support from the community and uh, <clears throat> we were able to transfer our equity from our other properties into this. And so it's been a journey. It's been a seven or eight years of borrowing money, raising money, you know, the Great Recession hit. So it's been a bumpy road, but, uh, but it's been worth it. Here's a general outlay of the campus. We have a hospital unit first, and that's where everybody comes to treatment. After they're assessed, we have four mental health um, specialists. We have a full-time psychiatrist for the first time this year and the 43 year history of Serenity Lane. They go to the hospital unit first. Uh, we have a full-time staff of doctors and nurses, 24 seven medical care. So they go through, a, uh, through detox under medical supervision. So it's a safe, compassionate environment. Um, all of our patients spend at least 24 hours in medical detox before, and sometimes longer, but at least 24 hours and before they're transitioned into the general patient population. Uh, we have four residence halls here. Each of the residence hall is, halls is a 3,200 square foot home with 10 bedrooms, double occupancy. So we separate patients by gender. So there's two uh, residence halls for men and two for women. There is a corresponding treatment pod, we call them. It's a, it's a relatively small 
building with two group rooms and two counselor's offices where they do group therapy. And, and so they'll go there from the residence hall, that's where they do group therapy. There's a large uh, dining area. Just think in terms of doubling our capacity, which means we're able to provide hope and treatment to twice as many people at one time as we've been able to in the, few, in the past. Larry, why don't you show, show us around? All right, let's go show take a look at the we'll campus. See what's happening. It's a great way to build relationships. If you're looking for a barber who understands the art of cutting hair, Francesco Michelli is the man. This guy really knows what he's doing. He takes his time, he understands his customer, and he knows what makes you look good. They even do the little extras, like a straight razor shave to get those little hairs off of all those places. Yep, even the top of ears. I'm telling you, if you want a good haircut, somebody who knows what they're doing, a true artist, go to my barber. Fresh cut. Francesco Michelli is the man. 541-357-6903. You'll love it. A number of businesses and local folks around the community went together to make this Serenity Lane campus happen. I love when business does that. We recently produced a video where a number of businesses got together. They had an idea. They said, you know what, we can, make, we can help with reduced childhood hunger in the area. They put together their own program with something that they already do, which is produce food. They went to Food for Lane County, and this program called Cereal for Youth is born, and kids all over Lane County are being helped by this. Watch. Hey guys, what's up? What do you need? Uh, we, our bus came late and we mm -hmm. missed breakfast. Uh oh, should we see what we have? You guys want some cereal? Sure. 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 This is a story about three local businesses working together to help solve the problem of childhood hunger. Some granola. Um, do you want milk on it? Yes, please. Okay. Why don't you guys each have a seat? and together they put a product together. They essentially created a cereal that was to be used for kids in schools where they didn't have breakfast. In 2005, Grain Millers, Glory Bee, and Golden Temple, now Attuned Foods, joined forces with Food for Lane County to create the Cereal for Youth program. What's really cool about this project is seeing three food companies come together with a food bank to do something good. I'm going to let you work by yourself with the cereal. This story with an update. Someone spotted this cow outside of Oregon City. We, my wife and me, stopped by, talked to the owner, took these pictures. It's available to any kids regardless of income. The original intent of the donors and the intent that we have is to help reach kids 18 and under who are in need of a snack at any time, morning, noon, or night. Grain Millers provides the grain. Attuned Foods makes and packages the cereal. In the early days, Glory B provided the honey. All three are still financial partners in the project. Food for Lane County manages the Cereal for Youth program and distributes the cereal to the schools. This is about food, but it's also about education. And I think it really does start with the children. At the top it says, grains make healthier grains whole and teaching them what is healthy sugar fat salt so choose them less often at Mount Vernon Elementary School in Springfield students are learning about food nutrition and the importance of eating right but the need for this cereal is even bigger than most would believe it is so important some of our children just simply don't have the opportunity to have enough of a breakfast or the kind of breakfast that will support their needs during the day. We have a huge amount of students, a percentage of students that are on free and reduced lunch. The teachers here use it for giving children extra energy during testing times. Keep working on your stuff. I see sometimes students who, to, to be able to have a bag of cereal to take home with them, it's like a present. 
The first year of the program, 8,000 servings per month were given to students. I will be giving you your bag of cereal for you to take for over the weekend. In 2013, that number was at 28,000 a month. Since starting the program, we've donated about 1.2 million servings of the vanilla crunchies or the blueberry flax. Grain Miller's plant in the heart of Eugene provides oats and understands the importance of taking care of the needs of local children. Lane County's Economic Development Department would like to see more collaboration like this between local businesses to solve local issues. Community. So it's a win-win for us when we have industry working together and building collaborative relationships and partnerships, but then also helping uh, a disadvantaged population that needs that assistance. These three companies simply create a program out of products they already produce. There's a lot of problems in this world that affect a lot of people, but they thought this is something we can do something about. You know, childhood hunger is something that we can get together and we can do something about. Well, we know when you are hungry that that tends to be the dominant thing that you're thinking about. So who can, who can remind me of what we said about that? Children will respond so much better to their teachers and to whatever communication is going on in class if they have some energy. If we tell them it's fuel. Right now, what started with two schools is now at 146 different schools and kids programs across the county. I would just love to thank those people for thinking of our students and, and it really makes a big difference in the lives of kids. What's inspiring to me is that it really was people in the business community who wanted to come together and do something to help. And so they didn't do it on their own, but they looked at their partners in the food manufacturing world and in the business world, and they got together and made a proposal to Food for Lane County. So I think it was a partnership all around, actually. So that's what's inspiring, is that level of partnership that was there. So Larry, tell me about, I mean, this is like the centerpiece of your new campus. You know, it is, Rick. This is my favorite part, my favorite place in the whole campus. I've watched this develop over the last year, year and a half. It's just a special place. I knew it would be from the time they started framing it. It was designed like that. Well, it is, and it was, I can't take any credit for that, but I can take credit for enjoying it because this is, it's just a wonderful place. So what happens in this room when a family comes here to visit a, a, someone in treatment? Think of a living room. Think of a place where you can go have a quiet conversation, a private conversation. That's one of the magical things about this and one of the really blessings about, frankly, working at Serenity Lane. We see people come in on a daily basis who've lost hope. And, and when they leave, they, they have promise. You know, their, their families are starting to stitch things back together again. Not always, but most times. And, and they leave here with a sense of hope that they're going to put their lives back together again. And it's, that's what makes this very special. And that's why this river you know, it's a metaphor, but this river that comes through here, I know it just looks like tile, but this, this tile that comes through here, we call it the river, and it's a metaphor for the journey to recovery. It is a journey, and, and I suppose sometimes it can be rocky like these pebbles. You can take the, the metaphor as far as you want, right. but it's a journey, and it's winding, and it's not always easy, but it's worth it in the end. Well, you do feel peace here, don't you? Oh yeah, that's why this is my favorite spot. Yeah. Every day I look in the mirror and I see this old man looking back at me. It looks more and more like my dad than it does me. And then I start thinking, you know, this really is the journey of my life. This is what I've been living for, is this part of my life. And yet as a culture, we don't really look at that. Well, we're going to focus on that on a new show we're doing called Elders, Sages, and Fellow Travelers. Take a look. In life's rush to keep up, what's new gets all the attention. Change can be uncomfortable and sometimes hard fought. What's new urges us to forget about the past. 
rocks and falls over. And then water comes down these sides and down the other area. Elders remind us to pause, to reflect, and to listen for wisdom. In our minds, we're forever young. But the reality is, we're changing. Time does not wait for our minds to catch up. Are you having more fun than before? Absolutely. I can do things that I couldn't do. I wasn't allowed to do years ago. Now that's freedom. Growing older is not the end of life's journey. It is the journey. Maybe it's time to explore the elder years, to look at what it means to be a sage. And perhaps in the process, as fellow travelers, discover the wisdom in the ages. So Rick, this hospital unit is the first stop when people come to treatment. And this, this hospital unit will allow us to treat twice as many patients as we do in our present facility. So it gives us 22 beds. And you know, it might surprise some people to know that this just looks like a regular hospital unit. Right. I mean, there's two patients stay in here. It's semi-private. You have a nice curtain that gives you some privacy. And there it says peace. and and dreams and that sort of thing. Even the subtle messages in the hospital room uh, give people hope. Uh, we have a wonderful staff of nurses and physicians here that just... Psychiatrists for the first time. We have a psychiatrist full-time here for the first time in 43 years. You know, but our nursing staff, they are so special. I mean, they work so hard to, to care for people. I mean, I remember the first day I came into treatment, I'm sitting on a hospital bed. It's like, how in the heck did I get here? Okay, and when you're in that hopeless state of mind, and you're in this robe, they've taken your clothes, and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm in a hospital room for my drug use. And you know, it's really important that somebody's there who cares for you and shows that they care for you. And our, our team of nurses and physicians and mental health professionals, they're just, they're special people. And this is where it all starts. This is where it starts. They start here and they'll stay here for at least 24 hours, maybe a little longer. Uh, the rooms are much better here than the old place too. They even have a bathroom. Well, here. you know, our old treatment center was an old fraternity house that we bought 42 years ago. So if you want to take a shower, you get your toiletry kit, your towel, and you walk down a semi-public hallway into a group shower like you think of in middle school or high school. So it's not the perfect situation. So this gives us one, bat one bathroom and shower for every four patients, every two rooms. It was brand new when Cy opened the store in uh, 1978. 50 pounds of flour when we make the dough, it actually makes about 100 pounds of dough. Do this every day. I figure over 37 years, we've probably made 13,000 batches of dough or more. It's the foundation of the pizza. Kind of the idea is you're just tightening it, getting the air out. No cracks, no holes in it. So from that two pound ball that had about a six inch diameter, we're taking it out to about 20 inches. Fresh ingredients. We make our dough, we grate our own cheese, we make our sauce, and I like to think that we make our pizzas with love. All right, that's 21 inch here. Size matters. Just down the road from Coburg in Springfield off of Mohawk is our favorite Mexican food restaurant, Ranchito Grill. Abe, Ruben, and the rest of the gang, this is the best place you can go. And every month, Ruben and Abe and Rick Dancer TV give away two free dinners to some lucky person who signs up in the restaurant. You gotta have food, that's the way to do it. You sign your name, give us a phone number. We do a drawing once a month and you win two free dinners. Natasha Doitery, you are the winner this month. Congratulations. And when you go in there, be sure and tell Abe or Ruben or anyone who helps you that you saw this on Rick Dancer TV because he loves to hear that and so do we. So Bill, remember when we were in Eastern Oregon doing that Ghost Town series, and we went to those dredge, there was those dredging spoils, that kind of that rock reminds me of the dredging spoils we had on that Ghost Town series, that we were back in Sumter, Oregon, and we'd done this trip for like eight days, and 
we were almost ready to kill each other by the end of this thing. Started in Shanico, ended up in Eastern Oregon. And you know what we should do? Let's just show them the story. Watch. They stand in mute testimony to pioneer courage, hardship, and sometimes broken dreams. It's almost as if the weathered boards of empty buildings are too stubborn to admit they've been abandoned. And in your mind's eye, it's not too hard to see the buckboards on the streets or hear the music from the old dance hall. We know it wasn't really that romantic back in the days of the early settlers. You worked hard and got little for it. But as Jerry Myers remembers, life was simpler. His kinfolk homesteaded near Sumter in the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon way back in 1878. And he thinks simplicity is the magnet that attracts visitors to these parts. They're looking for the atmosphere. You know, uh, they read the history is a real big thing now. And people come in here and kind of feel it touch it, see it. Because in those days, we worked hard for what we had, and we enjoyed what we had to the ultimate. Uh, we, we've just kind of gotten away from that, and I think people are really looking to get back to that. They'd, they'd like to get a little bit closer to things. Originally, though, it was gold fever, timber, wool, and the railroad that brought dreamers to live in these isolated valleys and hillsides. Looking at what's left of some of these towns, this was born. You can hardly believe that at one time several thousand people lived here. Saloons, hotels, stores, and homes covered the hillside just below the old mines. The old timers say the pioneers found what they were looking for. Times were good, at least for a while. But eventually the gold was too costly to mine, the railroads pulled up and relocated, and there was no way to ship the timber or the wool. The glitter in places like granite was beginning to fade. Now it's solitude that attracts residents. Tony Thompson runs the Granite General Store. But you have to be hardy. You have to be willing to work hard. You pay a price for living up here. It's hard economically. It's uh, hard physically. I mean, just keeping your house in shape, going through the winters we go through, uh, just all those things. You know, you, you work at it. You don't just come up here and kick back and, oh, well, no problem. I'll just take it easy. That doesn't happen. When the railroad pulled out of Shanico, the townsfolk walked away, leaving the city to the tumbleweeds and the sun and the wind. The outside world kept changing. Shanico just waited, slowly becoming a museum of our past, its legacy as a ghost town starting to take shape. Filled with wool. They stacked wool in here from... Uh... I guess they come clear from the, Alif the California border. Now, black bad times and broken dreams. The new pioneers have found them and are opening them back up for all of us. These you know, the, oh, these residence halls are pretty, pretty special. You're going to like these. So the residence halls are, these are where the patients will stay, you know, when they're, uh, when they're in treatment. There are four of them. They're all identical. Um, each home is a 3,200 square foot, well, each building is a 3,200 square foot home. It has 10 bedrooms, double occupancy. We like to say an alcoholic by himself is in bad company. Okay, so it's- So you keep two people to a room. Always two people to a room. And we've even gone to the point of having individual climate controls in each room. So imagine 20 people living in a home trying to agree on the proper you know, temperature. So each room is individually controlled. Um, there's a nice living room in here with a fireplace. You know, when people come to treatment, they're 
they're troubled, okay? They're troubled and, and, and they're guilty. And they have all kinds of, you know, their self-esteem is, is not the highest it's ever been. So having a nice quality place where they can come and just feel at home and relaxed in a quality environment, uh, maybe that's, in, that's conducive to finding recovery. They don't spend a lot of time here, to be honest with you. The treatment protocol, it starts at 7 a.m. and they have lectures and exercise and meals and group therapy and all that. So at the end of the day, when they come back to the residence hall, uh, they're exhausted and they have homework to do. So it, it's a place where they can sit in the living room, have a few conversations with other people who, who are in treatment, and then in a real nice, comfortable environment, do their homework, do a little reading, and then get a good night's sleep. Because, because I've been there. I've been there. I've been, excuse me, I've been in the, at the point in my life where I lost hope. And if you're, if you've ever been in that spot, you don't know how to get out, okay? It's not that you don't want to, you just don't know how. And every idea, I think in terms of trying to keep a hundred tennis balls in the air and every time you throw up a ball, it turns into a brick, comes down, hits you on the head, and you end up doing more damage. And, and the more guilt I felt um, when I was in my addiction, the, every behavior I had created a negative consequence. I felt guilty about it. My coping mechanism was drugs and alcohol. So it would, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And, and so what you end up doing is alienating everybody who's close to you. Okay? And then every solution you seem to come up with, you try and come up with, it, it doesn't work. And sooner or later you get to the point where you're just out of answers and you're out of hope. And it's embarrassing, it's humiliating you know, to come to a point in your life where you have problems and you can't solve them. And you don't know where to go to get, I mean, and even if you knew where to go to get help, it's, it's very humbling to tell somebody you don't know or even somebody you do know that you have a problem that's bigger than you that you can't fix and because the world says why don't you just fix it why don't you just stop okay and so why it's personal to me is because i've been there i've been in that hopeless situation i've walked through the doors of serenity lane fearful of what's going to happen of the unknown but knowing that whatever it is on the other side of those doors has to be better than what i'm experiencing today transitioning in life is a lot like crossing a bridge and when you're standing out here in Coburg on this 15 acres of property where Serenity Lane is going to help over the next 20 years, thousands of people transform their own lives, it's a little overwhelming. And you realize what a rich commodity this is and how many people are really going to have new lives after being here. Thanks for watching. So do you need to do a better job of marketing yourself? Well, Google says you're 80% more likely to get a hit on your website or your social media if you have a video. So call us and find out more about what we do and how you can get involved because we have a market, we have a brand, and we have an audience. Wouldn't you like to be part of that? Thanks for watching.